This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on insurance. Today we're going to talk about professional conspiracies that engage in insurance fraud. Many types of fraud that I have described in previous videos were solo activities. However, much of the so-called hard fraud is perpetrated through conspiracies where criminals in the legal and medical professions join together to defraud insurers. For example, there is the doctor-lawyer conspiracy. The doctor-lawyer conspiracy will often begin in one of two ways. An attorney uses individuals called chasers, runners, or cappers to recruit a clientele of auto accident victims, usually for a flat fee. They look for victims of actual automobile accidents and convince these individuals to visit the attorney who is, in fact, running a personal injury mill. The recruit may either be solicited to become a knowing participant in the scheme and receive payment for his or her involvement, or can remain an unwitting participant unaware that his or her claim has been manipulated for fraudulent purposes. Some of the victims are paid the flat fee of $100 to $500 and are never heard of again while the physicians create fake reports of injuries and treatments and the unscrupulous lawyer presents the claim on behalf of his victim client and shares any settlement equally or in some other percentage with the physician. Organizers of such schemes may also recruit friends, acquaintances, illegal aliens, gamblers to play the role of victims in staged automobile accidents. This is sometimes called crash for cash. In this type of scheme, the claimant is a knowing, cooperative participant in the fraudulent activity and may be involved in many different claims involving the same corrupt professionals. The attorney refers the accident victim to a cooperating medical practitioner or chiropractor who fabricates medical diagnoses and reports and prepares false bills. The fraudulent documents are then used by the attorney to obtain claim settlements and payments from insurers who fail to perform a thorough investigation and take the information provided to them by the lawyer as gospel and in good faith. There is an enormous public interest in avoiding the taint of fraud on determinations by one of the largest and most significant government benefits programs in the United States, Social Security. Confidence in the integrity of the system of awarding benefits is crucial to public acceptance of the statutorily imposed obligation of almost all working Americans to pay Social Security taxes and Medicare taxes on their income. Permitting the award of benefits based on evidence provided by a doctor through a lawyer when they have admitted they conspired, at least in other cases, to defraud the Social Security Disability Benefits System, obviously undermines confidence in the system. Consider Hicks versus Commissioner of Social Security, a Sixth Circuit decision from 2018. If the plaintiff, at the direction of his lawyer, goes to a doctor, Knowing the doctor will find permanent injuries when there are none, then the plaintiff, his lawyer, and his doctor have conspired to work a fraud on the court, and upon proper proof, all should be subject to sanctions, claims should be denied, and people should go to jail. The Sixth Circuit analysis in Martello versus Santa Ana, a 2013 decision, 
as to why agreements in violation of the ethical rules are void to be well grounded. In Martello, a doctor who had a law degree but was unlicensed, and an attorney entered into an agreement whereby the lawyer promised to pay the doctor a percentage of recovery on certain cases the doctor referred to the lawyer. A disagreement arose between the two, and the doctor had the unmitigated gall to sue the lawyer in federal court for breach of contract, fraud, and fraudulent concealment of settlement, and breach of fiduciary duty claims. On appeal, the Sixth Circuit concluded that the agreement violated the provision prohibiting fee-sharing with non-lawyers set forth in the Kentucky Rules of Professional Conduct. As such, the Sixth Circuit held that the agreement was void and could not support a breach of contract claim, even if it might result in a windfall to the crooked lawyer. In my experience as an expert witness, I was once asked by a lawyer to serve as his expert in two bad faith cases dealing with auto accidents. I, I reviewed the files. And what I found was that although the two accidents were totally different, happened at a different location in a different way, and they all were represented by the same lawyer, went to the same doctors, and had the same treatment. And when I compared the two medical reports issued to the two different plaintiffs, I found that they were identical except for the name and address of the patient. I returned the files to the lawyer, refused to testify on his behalf, returned to him the unearned portion of his retainer, and told him he should have read my CV, which pointed out that most of my life as a lawyer and as an expert witness has to do with insurance fraud and that I refuse to be a participant in an obvious fraud. This goes on. In one scheme, cappers station themselves at a poker casino in various Southern California communities where games of skill like poker are legal or outside Native American casinos where all kinds of gambling are legal the cappers would spot the big losers at the tables, and on leaving the casino, the gambler was approached by the capper with a proposition. In order to recoup the losses, all the gambler had to do was report to an insurer an accident rear-ending one of the conspirators' vehicles. For this service, the gambler would pay, be paid the money he lost at the casino. Cappers and runners are often found also at unemployment benefits offices, welfare offices, and any other place where people short on funds may gather. They become easy recruits for fraudulent claim schemes. When evidence was sufficient to permit the jury to find that there was an overall single conspiracy, that each of several professional defendants, doctors, and lawyers knew of the fraudulent nature of the collisions and injuries and had an active and essential role in executing the design, the denial of severance was not error, and that a speedy trial was not denied. This was U.S. versus Perez, a 1973 decision of the Fifth Circuit because insurance fraud has been going on since it was first invented back in the days of ancient Sumeria. It's nothing new about insurance fraud. Now, the medical profession is also involved in insurance fraud to a great degree, especially with regard to governmental types insurance like Medicare and Medicare. A doctor can initiate a medical fraud scheme by having a patient schedule a number of visits, even though the actual medical treatment is minimal 
or non-existent. The doctor then bills as if the services were rendered. In another version of the scheme, a physician will rent social security numbers from economically disadvantaged people who are not even ill and bill for services that they did not receive to Medicare or Medicaid. There have been cases where a medical provider purchased computer records of legitimate patients from a hospital employee and then submits invoices to Medicare or Medicaid which wires funds to the provider for the services claimed, although not rendered, and then, of course, disappears only to obtain a Medicaid and Medicare provider number under a different name. In California, investigators for Medicaid visited every approved vendor of durable medical equipment because of reports of rampant fraud. The investigators were shocked to find that some vendors who had been paid as much as $500,000 a month did not exist as anything more than a mail drop. Others had no evidence that patients actually received any of the goods or services claimed. When the investigation began, many vendors simply disappeared only to reappear at a different location with a new name. In an inflated billing scheme, medical professionals often use their patients as unknowing victims of the scheme. Inflated bills may be sent directly to an insurance company or government program, such as Medicare or workers' compensation. The patient is never aware that the bills were inflated or even presented. The physician is the one who knowingly and willingly sets out to defraud the system. These physicians know what they are doing, and they are committing these illegal acts with planning and perseverance. Sometimes they also conspire with unscrupulous patients and lawyers. Allstate Insurance Company, for example, sued a group of physicians for creating false and fraudulent billings, overcharging for treatment and misreporting the treatment provided. At trial, the jury returned a verdict in favor of Allstate and against the physicians for more than eight million dollars. A patient recruiter for a Houston durable medical equipment company was sentenced in November of 2011 to 21 months in prison for her role in a health care fraud scheme involving power wheelchairs. Matoyer, the recruiter, was convicted by a jury of one count of conspiracy to commit health care fraud, three counts of health care fraud, one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States and to receive health care kickbacks, and two counts of receiving kickbacks. The power wheelchairs were often billed to Medicare at more than $6,000 per chair and were never delivered to anyone who needed a powered wheelchair. In fact, they didn't exist. Only the bills existed. Another example is a doctor in Monroe, North Carolina, who was ordered to pay nearly a million dollars in restitution after she made false claims to Medicare over a six-year period. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the doctor agreed to pay $950,000 to the North Carolina Medicaid program to resolve false Claims Act allegations. As a condition of the civil settlement, the doctor was required to reimburse the government for the amount she wrongfully received from Medicare and also pay substantial penalties back to the program. The funds recovered will eventually be returned to North Carolina's Medicaid program. Dishonest lawyers tend to be more creative than physicians. The most notorious of all insurance fraud perpetrating lawyers 
was a lawyer by the name of Lynn Boyd Stice, who created what was known as the Kumis fraud. Because California law and that in most states requires that insurers, if there is a conflict of interest between them and their insured, retain independent counsel. Stites stepped in as independent counsel and did so by creating lawsuits with conflicts. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal described his fraud as follows. From the perspective of the government, it was established at trial that Stites had been the mastermind of a massive set of breaches of professional responsibility and of the criminal law, the more heinous because Stites was a lawyer and at least 12 other lawyers were his principal confederates in carrying out the fraud. The mentality that sees law as a business was here taken to a ridiculous Reductio ad absurdum. Litigation was unconscionably churned to make money for the lawyers. The essence of Stites' scheme, repeated over and over, was for Stites to control both sides of suits in which insurance companies were paying for counsel and to assure that the plaintiff's lawyers would not settle until the insurance companies would no longer pay the cost of defendant's counsel. Stites network of lawyers was known as the Alliance. According to the jury verdict, Stites scams extracted at least $50 million from the insurers in the period from 1984 to 1987. This is United States versus Stites, a Ninth Circuit decision in 1995. In a civil suit, Fireman's Fund also sued Stites and obtained a judgment revealing that Stites controlled a network of lawyers that was able to infiltrate both sides of several major lawsuits. Lawyers who were members of this so-called alliance would ensure that the plaintiffs would not settle. Through this process, as well as through the use of kickbacks, Stites and other members of the alliance extracted millions of dollars from the insurance companies who had to pay defense bills and settlements. I personally worked with Mr. Stites, who was suing one of my client's insurers, and I found him to be personable, professional-looking, and totally and completely devious and untrustworthy, and eventually was pleased to see that he had been arrested, convicted, and civilly found responsible for defrauding many insurers. He spent 14 years in federal prison as a result, and my guess is he is now living somewhere quite well on the money he stole. This video was adapted from my book, Zelma on Insurance Claims Part 109, Second Edition, which is available as the ninth part of the 10-part treatise, Zelma on Insurance Claims, and is available as both a Kindle book and as a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be interesting or useful to you or your colleagues, please pass it on. It's free. And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, my blog, and my Substack channel so that you can learn about future videos and future claims blogs. Thank you for your attention.